And what we're trying to do now, I've talked about using a particular kind of Neumani metric, which was nicely adapted to the Morse function. So let's first kind of formalize what I mean by that. So let's say, given the Morse function, f said why we like this metric in particular. Well, I've sort of hinted at it, but it just means that we can we can really depend upon the gradient of f with respect to g being exactly, you know, being a completely standard model inside this coordinate. And then the exercise is to show that um, um, so if you're fixing f show that uh, Space of adaptive G's is connected. Space for your metrics adapted to F is connected. In other words, if you have two of them, if you have two reminding metrics adapted to F, then you can find a um, one parameter family of reminding metrics, all of which are adapted to F, connecting one to the other. Does that make sense? The question, um, and this is sort of the sort of question we're thinking more and more about is how you go between different Morse functions and different metrics and so on. So it's sort of a warm up to that to that issue. Is, uh, uh, you know, if, if you can derive information about a manifold from a Morse function and a adaptive metric, and then you have different Morse function, different adaptive metric, you know, how do you know you're sort of getting the same information out? That's that's what the idea. Um, and uh, remember. I mean, e e even even earlier than this, you could just say, if I look at, if I have two coordinate charts near a critical point of f, such that f looks standard with respect to both coordinate charts, can, can I to interpolate from one? Is there one parameter family of coordinate charts and keeping f standard throughout the entire? And now let's get back to the, the, the problem we're thinking about at the moment is, um, uh, uh, so if, if we're, we're in the situation where I have, um, uh, so now I have uh, coordinates x, um, and 0, and 1, and we have a uh, Morse function f from x to 0, 1, Morse And I want to say, what does this tell us about the topology of X? Okay, so um, what should we say? So let me know. Maybe I should um, kind of tell you, I should tell you the punchline now. Um, and then and look forward to how we try to make it a learning by discovery process. So, so the, the picture I had, this picture is supposed to encapsulate everything that happens in general, right? So this is a little bit more than just a schematic, even though the dimension is low, right? Um, so this is my picture of my cobordism from M0, M1, M1 is the disjoint union of two circles up there, 
and then here's my single critical point. And one, my critical point is P, F of P, and um, what we're going to do is say that uh, what we're going we're to break scomorphism into um, well, first three, I said four parts, let me just say three parts, and then one of them will break it into two parts. So, um, first I'm going to go up to some, so I want, I want to find a, I'm going to use a coordinate chart, let's say, you, sorry, I don't know a lot of colors here, I don't know if the colors are, the colors, my colors are not particularly well thought out or anything, right? So, there's my, here's, here's, here's my coordinate chart, U, around P, in, within which everything is standard. And then I want to um, have, pick some epsilon so that uh, when I go up to, this is f of p minus epsilon, and then there's f of p plus epsilon. The first thing is, ignoring anything about the, um, the critical point, because f of p minus epsilon is lower than f of p, there's no critical points between here and there, so uh, th this is f inverse of, this here is f inverse of f of p minus epsilon, this here is f inverse of f of p plus epsilon, and the first observation is that from, is that this yeah. piece here, which is f inverse of the interval 0 to f of p minus epsilon. That part is just as, as, as with the, you know, has no critical points, therefore it's just diffeomorphic to a product, it's diffeomorphic to 0 f of p minus epsilon cross and 0. That's that part. And then the part up here, That is f inverse of f of p plus epsilon up to 1. And that's taking more from 2. Plus epsilon 1 cross f1. <coughs> but this is a slightly different argument. We're working from the top down, right, to get this different morphism. But again, in either case, we're just, what I, what I originally said is let's pick a metric on the whole thing, which is nicely adapted. To, to f inside this neighborhood, and then in this little piece we can rescale that gradient vector field to have length 1 with respect to, to df of it is 1, and similarly up here we can rescale so df of it is 1, and then we can flow, from here we flow forwards, here we flow backwards to get those different ones. So that's pretty straightforward. So anyway, the whole point is, uh, all, all, we're not doing anything really, we're just narrowing the issue down. Okay? But we can narrow the issue down so that something is happening inside this coordinate. Okay, and then um, uh, what, what we're going to work towards now are what are called handles. So we're going to say that this piece here, um, so what, what you want to think is that we now, x, x is built by taking a product on the bottom, attaching something, and then another product. Okay? And so all the interesting stuff happens here, and then this attaching something, well this is kind of big, right, but we want to say that really the only thing interesting is happening is, is right in here, and that the interesting part is uh, something that goes up and over this, this little uh, critical point, and that's going to be, I'll just draw a simple schematic first, we're going to sort of put on some little, in, in this picture exactly what's happened is we've attached a little handle, okay? And so literally like a handle. We've taken this thing a little strip over the top, and somehow then the rest of this there's something, there's nothing very interesting happens here, somehow there's a product going up there, that's what we're trying to be precise now, is what, what's going on in the other parts. Um, but then, so this thing, I'll just say that uh, the idea is f inverse of f of p minus epsilon, f of p plus epsilon, uh, uh, attaching Put it this way. Attaching this thing to f inverse of 
zero f of b minus epsilon um, is uh, is quote unquote the same as same as attaching a handle and I'll just tell you what the handle is just give you advanced warning but this handle is remember this is index k which means there's k dimensions going down and n minus k dimensions going up Okay, because remember the index is the number of negatives, so that's the descending, right? So this handle is k ball. This descending bit here is its dimension k ball, maybe very small, crossed with the upward direction and n minus k ball. Now that this is there's a lot of fluffiness in this part of the board here, right? So we want I'm going to try to be I won't be incredibly pedantic about it, but I want to be a little more pedantic. Um, okay, I want to try to tell you a little bit more about what that is. Then we're going to spend as much time thinking in concrete terms and low dimensions about what attaching handles means. But this is the first thing. Um, but that's the thing. This handle somehow is something that's going to encapsulate how the topology changes when you go up from over there. And uh, we're going to see it in this moment. Um, So then I'll get the picture that I had before, which was zooming in on this local model, just looking at the coordinate itself. I had my x1 up to xk as a horizontal axis, and my x plus 1 xn as my vertical axis. Right? And then in these local coordinates, everything's completely standard. So I have my, um, actually, it's worth drawing here what f inverse of f of p looks like as well. And F, in this particular example, f inverse of f of p, right, is going to be this figure eight. Notice it's not a manifold, right? Uh, maybe going, uh, what I forgot to remind you of, of course, is that the inverse image of a regular value is always a submanifold. Okay? So that all these things are submanifolds all along, but then this thing is not a manifold, it's a single non-manifold point at that critical value, but it's not too bad of a manifold, not too bad of a non-manifold. And a non-manifold point schematically looks like this, but it's actually technically a, you know, it's a, it's a cone. Okay, the, 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 the way that the non-manifold is. Okay, if you try to, so this is F inverse of F of P. I mean, so if K equals one and N equals two, this is exactly the picture. If, for example, K equals two and N equals three, then this is two-dimensional, right? And so then you have, um, you can actually have a cone like that. If k equals one and n equals three, then this direction will be two-dimensional. And so you have a cone going like this. And of course, I won't draw anything higher-dimensional right now. Uh, we will come, you know, you might be bothered by what if k equals zero, right? And if k equals zero, there's something misleading about all of these pictures that we'll come back to, okay? If k equals zero or k equals n, of course, is the dual. And the other thing to, that sort of should immediately pop out to you is anything I'd say about k, I could just turn the whole thing upside down, right? Replace f by minus f or 1 minus f, and then k would become n minus k and so forth. Indices flip, so you know, k equals 0 is the same issue as k equals n and so forth. Um, all right, so then, and then we have this. These two sheets together are f inverse. Minus epsilon. These two sheets are f inverse of plus epsilon. So the first thing is, what, what is this epsilon really? I want this epsilon to be a value such that um, uh, it's small enough so that um, precisely, maybe I should say this precisely, I want the inside the uh, I have this coordinate chart for you, which I label purple there, so we need purple here. Okay. So epsilon should be chosen um, long enough so that uh, uh, 
f inverse. Well, we can make, I drew you wiggly, why not make you nice and round? Um, Hey, might as well make you a nice round neighborhood. Okay. So that f inverse of f of p minus epsilon um, intersected with u, uh, I'm just going to say and f inverse of f of p plus that form intersect with you uh, are exactly as in the this diagram. Okay. So, you know, the, this diagram is just two-dimensional, but I claim that actually it's precise, right? So what do I mean? I mean that, um, you know, so if f form was too big, right, f would go out here, and then I might not, f inverse of f of p minus that form wouldn't actually come in here at all. Or maybe it would be start doing something, you know, this, you know, just touch there or something. So I wanted to come in and, and let's think actually what. Let's let's just as a warm up think about what f inverse of f of p minus epsilon intersected with. So I'm assuming u is a nice round ball. U is a is a ball. So if I actually intersect this with a ball of some radius, right, then if I look at this, this stuff and this stuff, that's actually going to be, if you think about it, it's characterized by the fact that um, I'm setting some of these squares with a minus sign plus the sum of those squares with a plus sign equal to epsilon. But I can characterize that as um, this, in this direction, I'm going to have a sphere. If I, if I look at just where it intersects the x1 of the xk axis, it's a sphere. right? Because if I set xk equals 1 of xn equals 0, right? then the sum of these is just going to be equal to epsilon. So this is a sphere of radius epsilon, and then thickened up in this direction by some amount. So this, I claim that. Um, So I claim that f inverse is epsilon intersected with u is, is uh, morphic to s. Well, it's a sphere of what dimension? So those two points symbolize a sphere. They symbolize the sphere in the x1 of the xk plane. So it's a sphere, it's a k minus 1 sphere. Okay? So it's a k minus 1 sphere crossed with a, uh, a ball or disk in this direction, okay, crossed with um, a b n minus k. Okay, so that's the number of directions here. And then similarly, f inverse of f of e plus epsilon intersect with u is a b k crossed with any questions on that? Um, I mean, it's not, it's not exactly this thing cross with this thing that flares out a bit, right? If you, 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 can, if you, get, if you, if you can't, can't see it, then actually we're, you know, I claim that the calculation you would do in these dimensions, right, to actually show that this thing is diffeomorphic to this thing, right? Okay, and then it in. It's exactly the calculation we would do in any arbitrary high dimensions to show that, remember, this is an S0. What they have here is S0 across the one right? Um, okay, so that, so, so this is what things should look like. And then um, I want to now take, uh, we can make, I don't want to do someone to take, take, remember, recall we have uh, this G, that, that. So we get grad G, F, the gradient vector field for G of F looks completely standard here. So it's just the, um, the sum, it's just minus 2x1 dx1 minus 2xk dxk plus 2xk plus 
one x plus one plus xn plus n. Okay, that's the gradient vector field. And I want to try to um, use that to flow from this level set up to that level set, right? Um, So maybe what I could do now is, let's say, take, um, I, want to, I want to zoom in. Yeah, I, I could just use this entire piece here, but really what I would like to do is, it doesn't matter. I'm going to take some uh, part, this, this, this piece of F inverse of F of P minus epsilon, this, this part of it that sits inside this coordinate neighborhood U, on the flow along um, this vector field, the gradient vector field, until I hit f inverse of f of p plus epsilon. Okay. And I'm going to take the union of those flow lines, and I'm going to take the closure of that. So I'm going to write that So let's let, um, this is my first approximation to a handle. This is going to be a slightly non-standard way to think about a handle at the moment. But, um, so let's let um, a equal Closure of the union of um, flow lines or IPF starting, I should probably say the forward flow lines starting. Starting at f inverse of f of p minus epsilon intersect with u. Um, and uh, um, let's just say the closure of the union of these things, all of that intersected with f inverse of f of p minus epsilon, f of p plus epsilon. Okay, so I could I just I start here, I flow forward as far as you can possibly go, I do the closure of all that stuff, but then I intersect it with this with this with what's the P here anyway. Okay, and I claim that you get something that I will now try to use So I start here and so if I start right here, I just flow, by the way, you know, these flow lines right are perpendicular to the level sets, right? It's a standard picture. And again, I claim that I'm not I'm not cheating by just drawing a two-dimensional picture and dealing with your intuition, right? It really is correct all the way through. And the, the um, actually, um, that way, I'm gonna get, well, I'm gonna get something. So if I start, if I start right here, remember I flow and I flow and I flow and I flow, and I flow Eventually, I can get to this point, right? But I never get anywhere on this x1 up to x k plus one up to x n axis by starting down here, and I never get to the origin. Right? If I start here and flow, it just takes me for a flow forever, right? But as soon as I take the closure of that, then I include all of this there too. So it's this funny-looking object here. Let's think about what that is a little bit. It's, I claim, first of all, do you, you see the picture object I'm talking about? Right? Um, you could also describe it somehow as, you could probably, you could take, there's another function which has level set, of, well, anyway, that, that, this is a good enough definition, right? You could also take the, remember in first year or calculus, you could find uh, this is exercise of finding um, orthogonal trajectories to given, you know, you have some, some, uh, some level sets or some function, you can find some other function with level sets that are orthogonal to that, so that's sort of, you can find another function whose level sets are, are, are these green curves, and then, and then the intersection of the level sets for that in this, but, um, so, the, uh, I want to think, I want to think schematically that this thing now is being, um, actually a kind of cohortism in and of itself, okay? So, A is 
love. I mean, it's, it's a cohortism. Right away, you should be bothered because A is not a smooth manifold because it has corners. Okay. Um, and but there's a, there's there, this notion can be made precise, and I'm not going to belabor the point. It's not that hard. You can actually define a manifold with corners, at least this kind of corners. It's not too hard to understand. It's cohortism from. So I want to think of it as. Um, uh, this this is the bottom of it, and this is the top of it. Okay, so it's a cohortism from a s um, k minus one cross b n minus k to a b k cross s k minus one. And again, maybe the picture in so this is the this is the picture drawn in the coordinate chart. The picture sort of on on the manifold itself. Is um, looks maybe a little bit better. So if I go back to the zoomed in, um, this is a everything between minus epsilon and epsilon. What I really have is I have um, my, so this coordinate chart here, I'm seeing um, this is the, I'm drawing that same coordinate chart, but I'm drawing it embedded in, in the manifold now. This, this, that direction there is the xk plus 1 up to 10. And then this direction here is the x1 of the xk direction. Okay, and then um, the this this neighborhood. So this is these two points there are those two points. That's the s k minus one. And then if I, I they're thickened up somehow to give me this. Um, So that interval and this interval schematically symbolize this sk minus 1 cross bn minus k, right? And then I flow forward with the, um, that should be green, that's green. And then I flow forward using this vector field, up, up. What we're call, what I'm calling um, A, and so that's the other picture. Okay. And so here's this down green. Here is the S K minus one cross P N minus K, and then at the top of it is the. This cohortism has sort of boundary of its own. Yeah, it's a cohortism between manifolds with boundary. So it has boundary. Yes, exactly. Well. A cohortism has boundary, but a cohortism well, I mean, has boundary on the side. Like, but it's a cohortism between things with boundary, right? It has, it has boundary on the sides as well, okay? Um, so th there is a well defined sort of notion of this. Um, and I, it, let me just let you sort of pen in your intuition for a little bit. But it's, uh, it's reasonable to talk about cohortisms between manifolds with boundary. And we always get a manifold with corners? Yeah, exactly. Okay. So a cohortism between manifolds and boundary is a manifold of corners. And so one, one way to think about what's going on, now, now let's, let's think about the rest of, uh, so, so if I now think about um, F inverse of F of B minus epsilon, F of B plus epsilon, whole thing, right? Well, that's got two parts in it, it's A, Union the complement, right? Union the B or something, right? So, this is B. so what does B look like? B is just a product. Okay. It's a product because outside here I can rescale the gradient vector field so that it has length one, so DF of it is length one. Um, so so 
B is diffeomorphic to um, f of B minus epsilon, f of B plus epsilon, I'll just write this, crossed with, well, crossed with B intersected with just cross with this stuff. So somehow nothing interesting is happening there. So we take, so, so, so here's, here's the, the first uh, approximation of how to think about X. First we build a product up until some level. Then we pick out some, some embedded SK minus one cross BN minus K inside the top of that product, okay? Now, we attach this funny green object there. Everywhere else, we just put another product on, on the side. So we put, we put, we took, we, we've got inside F inverse of F of P minus epsilon, we've got an embedding of SK minus one cross BN minus K. On the complement of that embedding, that image of that embedding, we build a product. We attach to that embedding this standard object here, right? And then we glue them together, those, those, the product and this standard object all on their sides, okay, in a, in a, in a natural way that, that's because how would we do that? We use, again, sort of just use the product, there's a product structure here and there's a product structure here coming from the green vector field, so we can just glue them together that way. And then we attach another product on the bottom. Okay. Um, and so, I'll, yes? But, but yeah, you 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 scaled the, the vector field, but you, there you could have scaled it as well. I what I, what I could do if I want well, see I can't scale it globally on all of A because of the fact that the vector field goes to zero. Yeah. Right. I could in order to to you scale out how to away these things, zero. I could scale it you know in the neighborhood of this boundary here to have to the df of it is one. Right. Just for the purpose of verifying the compact overlap. One one one. Uh, you know, philosophy that I learned is that if you're gluing smooth things together, you don't glue them, you know, face to face, you glue them with an overlap. Okay, and the overlaps are collar neighborhoods and boundaries, which is sort of basic existence there. Boundaries of smooth manifolds and collar neighborhoods. Here you have, that's one of the things that makes manifolds with corners a little trickier. You have to say, what's a collar neighborhood on the corner, right? And it's actually, you know, just like a collar neighborhood on the boundary is the boundary cross set half space or half you know like collar neighbors on the corner are the corner which is a submanifold cross a quarter space cross that or you know, you, 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 you can you can figure out what the correct definition should be for all of that. It's all natural but um, okay so I, I sort of this is not the most standard way to talk about what's happening. Um, and I'm gonna tell you the more standard way in just a second. But I kind of like this way of thinking about it because you really sort of decomposing, that you're attaching something along, it, it, everything is a cobordism, okay, including this little element, so we've decomposed, we've decomposed um, this big cobordism into a product cobordism, a product cobordism, and then this middle section has be, been decomposed sort of horizontally into a product cobordism here, and then the special handle thing, right? But um, let me, let me say why so one thing that I won't prove here is that um, maybe I should just write down something I said. So um, so we can so we can so x put it this way is diffeomorphic to um, put it this way m zero an interval doesn't matter. I'm going to now say just any old interval zero one cross m zero. I started by saying zero up to f of p minus epsilon, who cares, right? Zero one cross m zero um, with union, union what? Union uh, this thing A, which I'm gonna think of as this model A, this is actually the green thing inside, so it's not a completely standard object. A glued, I need more space glued to well, the top of it, one cross m zero. I do blue things. Um, this picture. Via embedding Sorry. 
first I glue that thing, so now I get, I take the product, I glue this thing on that then has sides on it, and then, um, and union, uh, the, uh, com uh, complement, I'll just say union integral part complement. So I've got inner complement of the leg. And then I could say, and then there's the top, which is another interval across the whole thing. But there's no reason to say, put that at, you know, that, that interval at the top is not really relevant. Right? I mean, I, that doesn't change. Gluing on, once I've got to, to F inverse of F of P plus epsilon, I don't need to you know, mention going all the way up to one. I just care about one. Okay? Um, so comments are that A, this thing A, I mean, I, I originally, I guess, described it as a subset of X, but really I want to think of A is a standard object in Rn. And it's a standard proportion from this to this, and it's defined as in this way. But it, now it looks, let's talk about the, the now I'm going to get to the more standard, the more normal presentation of it as a handle. Um, so an alternate way to think about it. Another, another way to think about this is this is a zoomed in picture of the manifold X, right? And then the rest of the stuff, between, you know, you can, if you want to see the rest of F inverse of F of P minus epsilon, F of P plus epsilon, you know, it's out here, right? So in between this, this goes on, and then you, know, you can think of, well, often the rest of the manifold, you know, something, there's no new critical points, but this is, this is F of P minus epsilon, and then you know, it has some interesting topology, but here we're not seeing that, right? So this is just a product outside, and that's the product part. Okay, so let me schematically draw, uh, so, so the, the two other approaches to thinking about what we've done is to say, well, I could just say, but let, me, let me give a historical point of view. First, um, originally when Morse was doing Morse theory, he wasn't thinking about trying to nail down the smooth, the diffeomorphism type of X. He didn't want to necessarily, or he didn't know how to say X is diffeomorphic to something. He was interested in doing sort of standard classic algebraic topology and finding the homotopy type of the manifold. Okay, so what is a homotopy equivalent to? And so, in particular, if you can find something in deformation retracts onto, that's good enough. And so, if you, all you care about deformation retracted retraction, all you've done really is you've attached this object. Okay, so A, as a t so you know you're attaching this funny green thing onto, right? That's the other thing to remember: is the rest of f in so f inverse of f of p, zero up to f of p minus epsilon sits out here. Then you attach this green thing in, but up to homotopy, you're just attaching this cell, yeah. right? So now we say once you attach things, everything can deformation retract. Back, you can't deformation retract back to this um, f of p minus epsilon, but you can deformation retract back onto f of p, everything up to f of p minus epsilon union this disk of running across the memory right now. So f inverse of uh, cell so originally, and fourth, f inverse of uh, zero one. 
homotopy equivalent to um, deformation retracts onto. deformation rejects on that thing. And so then you can get a, what's called a cell decomposition of the whole manifold this way. Um, but we, we, you can be better. So that's that's more. So then the next thing is um, handles instead. You can say, well, really all we've done is we've attached, let's, let's thicken this thing up a little bit. And we've attached some, something that looks like this. Okay. Um, and so this is BK cross BN minus K. Okay. And so you could, if, if you didn't care, notice that this issue of corners is a smooth issue, right? And if you only care about what's going on topologically, you could say, so handles topologically. When I say topologically, if I say topologically as opposed to smooth, I mean, you know, just home, up to homeomorphism and so forth, right? Then I could say that F inverse of 0, 1 is homeomorphic to F inverse of 0, F of B minus epsilon uh, union, this handle, which is a BK plus BN minus K. I'm suppressing now what I mean by union, okay? but every time I'm, when you glue something on, you're gluing it by a particular embedding of some part of its boundary into the manifold. And then the, pro the, 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 the problem with that is that then this thing has sort of even worse corners. It has, so then my manifold now looks like this, because out here is, is this thing, and then I attach this handle. And then you could then, so um, the, the next step is to say, well, uh, so, so here's what. Um, my advisor, Rob Kirby, would have said is that um, smoothly F inverse of 0, 1 is diffeomorphic to uh, F inverse of 0 F of P minus epsilon, which is a product, right? Um, union BK plus BN minus K when the corner smooth. Okay. So what that means somehow schematically is you take this this object, this thing that's just a product, and then you somehow, in some quote unquote canonical way, add a little bit so we end up with smooth corners. Back when people were first thinking about this, there was a lot of hemming and hawing about how unique is that and so forth, and is, um, and eventually there, there are papers buried in the literature somewhere that say that, you know, once you define what it means to smooth, and two different ways of smoothing give you, you know, different there are choices involved, but the choices don't actually matter up to diffeomorphism. Right? Um, the final thing is you could say that the thing we're attaching really is, um, so, so, uh, we could say that we're attaching some object. So BK cross BN minus K is also something with corners. The A that I was talking about has even more corners than BK cross BN minus K. A final thing is to say that the object you're attaching is something that just by itself looks like this. So and then one more color, so I'll use purple here. So sorry if you're taking notes, this is pretty terrible. You could say that you're attaching something that kind of has built-in flanges on it, so that when you attach it, even though it itself is not smooth, it's even worse than having corners. It has cusps, right? Smoothly, there a point in here has a neighborhood that's you know not like a half space or a quarter space. It's much worse. But it has it has these built-in flanges so that when you do glue it on, you end up with a smooth manifold and a smooth boundary. Okay, and um, uh, the So, uh, and, 
tent. Actually, you'll see this if you read um, Milner's book. On, so I never gave references, right? I'm mean, not using a, a book. But if you've looked at all, there's a standard book up by Milner on Morse theory. Um, and Milner's Morse theory, he has a very elegant way to sort of uh, create a second function, the F tilde or something, which looks just like F outside this open neighborhood. But inside this open neighborhood, it, 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 the, the levels, one, level, one will have level sets like this, the other one will have level sets like this. And so you can take the intermediate level sets and pick out exactly this nice piece that has um, these flanges built into it. Um, so Milner's book on Morse theory uh, has a way to do this and a way to, uh, to find, I, I like to do handles with, handles with flanges. Okay. No one, this is also not standard technology. Um, and uh, let, me, let me end by giving sort of another way to think about um, about this. So the reason I'm, I, the reason I'm sort of not giving you kind of totally coherent presentation but giving you these different ways to think about it is partly because I haven't decided the best way to present it and so I, but also because when you read different books you will see all these different points of view. And we're going to next time start looking at examples which I hope will give you a better feeling of this and eventually it becomes kind of tedious to to, to labor all the coordinate charts and so on, and it's better to work with examples which then sort of drive home what's really going on. But let me give you one more way to sort of think about um, uh, getting this. So, so what I could do is I could say, I, so I'm going to try to find, and since what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to find this some elementary piece of uh, of, of the cobordism near this critical point that captures exactly how the topology of the manifold is governed by the critical point, some piece that you attach, right? So, um, in, in, inside this coordinate chart, inside you, right, I can consider the following function. Um, let's call it uh, tau. Okay, tau is going to be a function from uh, F inverse of f of p minus epsilon to I'm going to say R union infinity. Uh, actually, it's going to be uh, positive angle. So I just write this one: zero infinity close brackets. Okay, you can take the value of infinity. At certain points. Okay, and what tau is? Tau of p is equal to the time it takes. Yeah, from f inverse of f of p minus epsilon to f inverse of f of p plus epsilon um, flowing along. Okay, and oh, different p, tau of q. Time, time to get from here to there. Actually, from Q. Right. Q is in. So Q is a point in here, right? And then time. If you start at that point, and you're going to flow forward along this gradient vector, you want to get to F of P plus epsilon. And as I said, there are certain points that never get there, right? And that's why those points are falling. It can really ever be zero. It can never be zero. So, <laughs> all right. Um, and uh, okay, so so although it takes can take the value of infinity, I can still multiply it by a bump function if I want to. Okay. Um, so noticing that f inverse of f of p minus epsilon epsilon is one k run time. I'll tell you what I'm going to do next time. I'm going to, uh, let's, I'm, I'm, what I'm going to do is I'm going to multiply tau by a bump function in this variable. Okay, a bump function is going to be you know, zero outside some uh, epsilon radius and then it goes to one. Okay? And so then I'm going to consider the union of forward flow lines with respect to that time, the, the mu times tau. 
and I'll get something that looks like So I will start. In, inside, inside here, I'm just going to flow forward as I always would have done. It's a small number, right? As I always would have done. But then as I go, if I look at, as I go further away from here, I, when, when, when the bump function is zero, I'm, I'm drawing the points I get to when I flow with respect to this function tau, flow for time tau times the bump function. And I'll get something that looks like this, and then interpolates up to there. This. And, and I want that's going to be the, the you know the union of forward flow lines by tau times bump function, and then the closure of that, and that's going to be a nice. This is another nice thing that I can sort of think of as a standard object that I attach.